Welcome to Realcast, the weekly roundup of the real asset markets. My name is Richard Betts and I'm joined this week by Dan Innes, Paul Strom and Nicole Dines. We've been looking this week at, uh, at, at some of the big global trends um, and hopefully looking beyond the COVID crisis in the RealX Global Trends event. Nicole, what have you kind of picked up from that over the week? Yes, we've had a very busy week in real asset media, sort of five days of, of uh, back-to-back events on all aspects and all sectors of real estate. Uh, on capital flows, there was a consensus in the panel that foreign investors are poised to come back as soon as travel restrictions are lifted and that there's a huge pent-up demand. And uh, Kim Politzer of Fidelity International said at the moment there's a lot of obviously focus on vaccine rollouts and who's ahead like the UK and who's behind like Europe. But actually in a few months time it won't make any difference. What really would make the difference would be the economic stimulus that countries will, will be more of a factor in where, which countries are successful. Countries with domestic investors, strong domestic investor base like Switzerland, like Norway, like France have done very well this year, while countries like Spain and the UK, more reliant on foreign investors, have done less well. But that again is going to change as soon as foreign investors come back. And uh, there was a, the UK, for example, which uh, the last good year for that, the best year for the UK, with the top year was 2015, which uh, was not a coincidence the year before the Brexit referendum, while for most other European countries, uh, the best year was 2019. Well, the consensus again is that the UK this year will catch up. Uh, because the Brexit uncertainty is out of the way and uh, and obviously the vaccine rollout is going well. There, there is an economic stimulus plan in place. So all factors are, are pointing to the, to the to London in particular, you know, going back to being uh, you know, the sort of the international investors' favourite favorite city in Europe. So we'll see. We also had um, sessions on impact investing. We've uh, done a lot in the past on ESG. And I say ESG has now become mainstream, but impact investing is definitely next. And real estate as a sector is the obvious uh, place for impact investing because by its very nature, real estate is rooted in the community and it is socially useful. So more and more investors uh, are, are seeing the, you know, the, that it makes sense to invest invest in, uh, in socially useful um, buildings such as education, such as uh, affordable housing. We also had session on student housing and senior housing, which again are two impact investing sectors. They used to be niche sectors, but now we see a, a growing number and range of, of investors, including high worth connected individuals, pension funds, as well as insurance companies. So we also talked about cities and in cities are you know, obviously have emptied out during the pandemic for obvious reasons. But again, Again, the consensus is that they'll, they'll come back in a big way because they're so economically dominant and they're so strong. I mean, Paris is, represents 78% of transaction in the whole of France, for example. But they will change. They will change. They will become more sustainable, more integrated. Uh, we've talked before about the 15-minute city, and they will be very successful, especially the first cities to have the idea, like Paris and Barcelona, that are actively working towards that sort of series of clusters within a big city that allow people to have the benefits of a big city, but also the benefits. Of, of the 15-minute city of you no know, long commutes and so on. Having a sense of neighbourhood, again, a sense of community. And finally, we had a really interesting session with Sean Cooley on the seven key trends of real estate. Hybrid working, omni-channel, the march of the machines, uh, autonomous cars, 5G electric cars and data centers, all very much linked and very much linked to technology. And he said something really interesting that, um, you know, lifts, elevators, once upon a time, revolutionized real estate by opening up vertical spaces, by allowing um, taller buildings and skyscrapers, and that the combination of autonomous cars and um, and, and 5G and you know, better connectivity will open up horizontal spaces so that people will be able to live and work much further out than they do now. And for example, in future, your autonomous car will be your mobile office. So it's a little glimpse into the future from Sean Cooley. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. There's a huge amount to absorb from those sessions. Um, and if you did miss those, um, then they're all available on demand as well. Um, Dan, what have you been watching? This week I've been following the demand for, for real assets from online sales. And Ocado's quarterly performance hit the headlines. I mean, during the lockdown, it pushed Ocado's grocery sales up 39% in the last quarter. Ocado Retail, they're the joint venture between Ocado and Marks and Spencers. They dispatch about 329,000 orders a week. And in the 13 weeks up to the end of February, they had a small increase than some analysts had expected. But their share price at the end of January had peaked at nearly double where it sat at the same time, at the same time last year. The average order size is about £147 against £110 at the same time last year. And that's what's pushed the revenue up so high. And Tim Steiner, he's the chief executive at Ocado, and he said 
that sales would grow in this second quarter of 2021, but not at quite the same pace that they experienced last year, but should have grown by about 40% by the end of this year because of things like new fulfillment centres. And they opened one in Bristol last month, and they've got larger ones in Hampshire and Essex opening towards the end of, of this year. And they're actually looking for more sites. Another sector into the office, uh, to the world of office space, has got a bit of a mixed bag uh, of news coming out of the office sector. According to the UK's um, Office for National Statistics, they reported that 53% of workers travelled to work in this last week. And that's up 48% from last week. But the Times have also published a report by the Bank of England suggesting that 34% of the workforce will continue to work from home after the pandemic for at least one day a week. Elsewhere, in a story picked up by a lot of the nationals, British Airways, the airline, said that they were, they were reconsidering the role of their major headquarter building at Waterside in, in the UK. And they'd hired consultants to look at the valuation of that, that office complex, which um, houses about 2,000 staff. Meanwhile, Google announced that they expect to spend $7 billion this year on expanding its network of US offices and data centers and saying that it, it valued the role of employees coming together in person to collaborate. And that's in addition to Google's physical presence. It came part of a bit of a recruitment drive uh, to appoint uh, at least 10,000 new full-time roles. And lastly, um, it's just interesting to see the, the, the concept of COVID passports beginning to show its face in the world of real assets. And, and as staff kind of begin to prepare returning to the office space, you know, shop floors and construction sites in greater numbers, I mean, in, in an article in The Telegraph on Friday, Mace, the construction company, they said they'd started workplace testing in the UK as, as recently as January uh, to make staff feel safer and prevent an outbreak of shutting down operations. But, but they said they were continually ramping that program up and had already undertaken at least up there one and a half thousand tests but have the capacity to do a thousand tests a week. So yeah, COVID passports, definitely one to watch. And I think that's that's something that, that is going to be coming a, a across Europe. Um, it's very difficult to see that being avoided, I think. Paul, what have you been following? Uh, this week, AEW announced it's made its first acquisition in the European life sciences sector. It's brought a, a scheme called Sidmark and Five, which is a fully led asset in Medicon Valley of Copenhagen. On behalf of its recently launched Eurocore fund, which has closed on 415 million of, of equity commitments. Sidmark and Life Science campus has about 33,000 square metres of space. The Medicon Valley is a life science cluster. It's, it's quite large that spans eastern Denmark and southern Sweden. And Sid Martin's 10 kilometres from three of Denmark's major universities. Christina Offshonka, a senior fund manager for Eurocor at AEW, said that they've been looking for opportunities in life sciences sector, given resilient income and the low supply of high quality stock. And that was even before the pandemic brought the, the, the sector into sharper focus. Another trend reinforced this week was uh, finding alternative uses for retail demonstrated in Leicester by Hammerson, which owns the High Cross Shopping Centre and has submitted plans to redevelop the former Debenham store there into new homes for rent. Hammerson's working with private rented sector specialist Package Living, and it'll convert the Debenham store into over 300 new homes and improve public realm. Mark Bourgeois, uh, Managing Director UK and Ireland at Hammerson, said that since opening its doors in 2008, High Cross has firmly established itself as an integral part of Leicester, while the structural shift in retail and changing consumer shopping habits have meant that uh, destinations such as that need to adapt. Meanwhile, another study has been published to look at whether people will be returning to the office when we get through the health crisis. This one's by Skanska, and it looks specifically at CEE. And some of the conclusions were that since the first wave of lockdown until today, the number of people working only from the office has increased by 26%. Uh, almost half of employees go to the office every day, despite over 60% of their respondents claiming they do have comfortable working conditions at home. And employees in all the surveyed countries indicated the ability to maintain a work-life balance and have direct conversations with co-workers was the biggest advantage of working in the office. Surprisingly, perhaps when asked about the biggest disadvantages of working from home, they said uh, that the inability to maintain a healthy work-life work balance was the problem. Uh, this, that and that was admitted by more than 40% of workers. CBRE Investor Intention Survey published this week said that investors are only expecting a slight decrease in the demand for offices this year. 
and around half of them say they expect a dip of only about 10%. Pricing in the office sector is also expected to remain stable. And while 99% of investors are looking for discounts for hotel purchases, 95% expect discounts on high street retail, only 39% are looking for discounts on prime stabilised office assets. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see what's happening in terms of those investor intentions and also the move back into the office. A lot of discussion, um, particularly here in London with people looking forward to going back, but very mindful, of course, that, that there are still lockdowns even this week in uh, in Paris, in Poland and, uh, and also in Italy. Um, Thanks very much, Dan. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for joining us um, and look forward to seeing you next week for our regular roundup of the week in real assets. Music